like read the scripture in terms of the whole of scripture. Tonight, we're going to talk about when you actually pray. <laughs> All right, I'm, I'm sorry, when you actually uh, read scripture and you read it in the context of things like prayer and uh, meditation and other things. Okay, in other words, Wesley doesn't just want us to pick up the book and read it. He wants us to read it in a way that will be formed and shaped by it. Uh, let me try saying that this way. One of my criticisms of the church today, that's my job. My field is church and society. So one of the ways I make my living is being critical of the church, okay? <laughs> one of the criticisms I have of the church is that we study. I'm not against that. We do education. I'm not against that. But the thing I don't think we do nearly enough of is training so that we have opinions. We may not always have skills, of course. I mean, this is a crowd that's been around the barn a few times, some of you. I think I've been around the barn more than anybody in here, if age is the indicator, okay? But nevertheless, uh, I know you've got skills. But think about what happens if the church begins to focus on training that forms and shapes us, okay? I do a lot of work in community organizing. One of the blessings of my life is that I have worked with eight community organizers in my lifetime. And I mean, it's like apprenticing to a terrific bricklayer, all right? They know things we don't know, you know, and, and you learn it by practicing it, by being trained, by working with people. Got the picture? So what we're going to look at tonight is not only how do you read, well, Wesley, how do you read the text? But tonight, how do you practice reading the text so that we are formed <coughs> and shaped by it? Got the picture? And then we'll give you a little exercise to do uh, toward the last half, and uh, you can put that into play. Okay? Let's look up here first. Uh, for Wesley, remember that the scripture is the first and last court of appeal for us. In other words, he means in that. Are there errors in scripture? Of course. Of course there are. But he would say that in that scripture, you get the truth of what God has done in ancient Israel and in Jesus Christ and what God will do. And this is a God who will fulfill God's promises to the people of the world. Okay. So in that kind of a claim, he would say, yes, there's truth there. And that's our first and final court of appeal. Okay. Now there are places in scripture where it says God ordered the killing of men, women, and children. Do you believe that? Some might, I don't. Uh, I would say that Wesley wouldn't believe that either. <laughs> I don't know a major theologian who would. I don't know a major biblical scholar who believes God ordered those women, children, men to be killed. Okay, let's go to the next one. Wesley wants us to read scripture so that it forms and shapes us. Let me tell you the temptation I have, all right? I'm an academic, okay? I taught in a graduate school for 32 years. When I'm not writing a book, I read 40 hours a week. I just flat love it. Ask the woman back there. I don't ever <laughs> get tired of reading, okay? That's, that's who I am. That's what I do. What I have to watch is I can get interested in reading the Bible. Now, uh, let's see. What is Paul's position here? What's he saying there? Ooh, how does that connect with this? And here, now how do I get this together? What's going on there? I get so busy analyzing the text, I'm not asking the question, text, how is God speaking to you through these scriptures? Hear the difference? 
Also, how do we get ourselves shaped, trained, so that we can hear the scripture better? <laughs> we actually can. This is a testimony of the text, the Bible. This is a testimony of the tradition of the church. A couple of thousand years that we can train our ears. We can train our eyes. I was a very mediocre baseball player, okay? But what I want you to know is even I could be trained to do some things right playing ball, all right? Let me give you another example. This comes from the Marines. Did I do this last week? I'm, I'm doing too many things, too many places. And, and yeah. The Marines have a thing they call drown proof. My pastor, uh, Ron, uh, uh, oh God, I've forgotten his last, Ron. <laughs> he was a Navy chaplain. And he told me that, uh, the, uh, that this is a training they do to make you drown proof as a Marine. They have the fuselage of a helicopter over a big tank of water. And they say to the Marines, you're going to get on this helicopter and we're going to drop you down in the water. Now you'll be buckled in. So once you hit the bottom, you're free to come out of that fuselage anywhere you want to. So they get in, buckle in, they drop them in the water. They have to get out. Then they say this, all right, now we're going to drop you in the water again. But this time, you're going to uh, have to go out the window or the door we assign you to. You can't go out the one you choose. So they assign them windows and doors. They drop them in the water. They have to unbuckle, find the window of the door. Okay. Then they do it a third time. They say, this time, we're going to turn the fuselage upside down. You will be buckled in. And then you have to unbuckle and get out of there through the door, the window you're assigned. Hmm? You know what I asked when I heard that story? Ron Brooks. <laughs> when I heard that story, I said, when do we as the church ever do anything like that kind of training? What would happen if we did? I told, I think I told y'all last week, hospitals are now beginning to train their personnel and how they de-escalate situations. What it is, is it's those strategies and tactics of old line, uh, nonviolent work. You know, I know some people who are really expert in that and they were doing it back to the civil rights movement and so forth. And uh, somebody walked in here with a gun, you know, if they got a gun, well, they wouldn't have a gun. They'd approach the person and they got a better chance than we have of us not getting shot <laughs> because they know how to de-escalate. Okay. So what am I saying? I'm trying to say we want to read the Bible in such a way that we're asking God to form and shape us as Christian people. Okay. Next, when you read the Bible, respond in the reading to the character of God. All right. How many of you see God as one vengeful, hateful being that really wants to kick our butts into an eternal flame? I can put that more graphically if you like, but I won't. <laughs> uh, hmm? I, I take it nobody does. Do you see God as loving? Does God care about you? Hmm? Then when you read the text, Wesley would say, read it with God's presence who loves you, whose character is such that God cares more about you than anyone else, I mean, than any other being in the world. God loves you, okay? Um, response, uh, read scripture as a means of grace, all right? That is, Wesley believed that when you read scripture rightly, God's grace will come to you from the text. That's not a power of the text. It's a capacity of God when we work with the text. You hear the difference? So that kind of, 
that kind of means of grace, God's grace. I, uh, I remember I was in seminary in my second year. I'd done a bunch of religion courses, philosophy courses in college. So I wasn't, this wasn't new to me, but I was reading a theologian named Hordern. And I don't know what it was exactly, but he began to talk about the grace of God, that he, that God loved me huh, infinitely, endlessly. And I don't know what it was. All I know is that in that moment, I had a clarity about that I had never had in my life. And I'd been a member of the church since I was 10. God, I'd sat through a thousand sermons, all right? But I heard it. Remember those ears? You get trained, formed, shaped to hear what God is doing. And in this case, uh, the text becomes a means of God's grace. Some of you, I dare say, have that with a hymnody. Hmm? Uh, that the, in fact, my hunch is there are a number of people in the room for whom your theology comes out of the hymnody. Hmm? That is, you learn what you believe about the Christian faith from singing Amazing Grace. Hmm? When our son was killed, I remember the thing that, uh, I think the thing that uh, powerfully spoke to me. I believe God spoke to me in that him that we sang, you know, um, hope of the world. Oh, Christ, thou great, that great compassion. And, uh, and that had just um, clarity of a kind that I think, um, I don't know that I've ever heard a hymn speak to me the way that hymn spoke to me at that memorial service. And I'm, I'm not unique in this. If you've lost loved ones, and I expect you have, some of you have, you know how the hymnody speaks to you. I'm suspicious that in heaven we don't talk, we sing. And I have this dream that I'm a tenor. <laughs> 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 you know, and uh, so, but it, but it is a means of grace. Now here, this piece here, which is very important for Wesley, the text it can be a means of grace to anyone, anyone, no matter who or what you are. Hmm? No matter. It can still speak to you. Now, Wesley's got this notion of prevenient grace. grace. We'll talk more about that next time. Prevenient grace is the grace that's working on us always, universally, on everyone even when we don't know it, it's always there. It's always chewing on us. God gooses us all the time, all right? Now, I know we can be so paved over. Well, that's the wrong, uh, we, we may not feel it. <laughs> we could be sealed off from it, from our side. But Wesley's got this notion that God's prevenient grace is always chewing on us. Every one of us. And prevenient grace doesn't stop with sanctification. It's still operative. Okay. But, um, <clears throat> okay. So it can be to anyone. All right. And scripture, how, how do I say that? Um, uh, the uh, engagement with scripture is more than merely reading it. Uh, you ever read a biblical text because you were supposed to and you just read it? He's saying that ain't enough. You, even when you have people like, you know, Chung Ho and Evie reading the text on Sunday, any of you ever just blank out? <laughs> of course, I never do that, right? <laughs> you know better. huh? Uh, Wesley's saying you can't just read it. And you can't just listen to it, okay? It's an engaged reading of the Spirit with the Spirit 
in the text. And then I love these things. Wesley says, read it, meditate on it. Hmm? Meditate on it. Uh, do it constantly. Wesley had this quality about him. I can do a little of this, but I never develop it. He was a genius at it. Scripture was so much a part of his life that he just used the language of, te of the text in his conversations, not just in his preaching, not only there, but just in his conversation. He would have a, a text that would crop up, and he'd use it just as a matter of course. He says, do it regularly. Now, uh, I made a commitment to myself. I'm going to read a chapter of the Bible every day. Now, I haven't done that in the past. What I tend to do is study the Bible. I got to reading Wesley here this week, and I said, you know, you really ought to read a chapter a day for crying out loud. You've been studying this thing forever. Why don't you just read one, you know, and, and, and listen to what Wesley's saying to you, you know. Remember now, as an academic, what I love to do is understand stuff. And uh, what Wesley's saying is sample, that ain't enough. You got to get formed and shaped by it. Okay. So look at the next one. He, this is where he'll, he, re, we repeated this the other day. We'll repeat it again next week. Probably we have it. He says, read the Bible for the general sense. That's some of the language he uses. Another thing he uses is read the Bible in the light of the analogy of faith. And what that means are some very powerful notions for Wesley. Like you want to read the Bible in terms of original sin. By the way, if you don't believe in original sin, I want to talk to you. <laughs> oh, Reinhold Niebuhr one time says, said he was a great theologian, mid 20th century, took a class with him once. <laughs> uh, he said that the doctrine of original sin is the only empirically verifiable doctrine of the church. <laughs> he meant that's one you can prove. <laughs> All right. Uh, we'll, about, we'll do something with that later. Uh, <clears throat> but also, he wants you to read it in terms of God's justifying. We talked about that before. Justification, justifying grace, a prevenient grace, and then that, uh, I'm sorry, prevenient justifying, and then sanctifying. The grace that makes us holy, the grace that heals us, the grace that that, uh, that uh, restores the image of God within us, okay? Um, so he wants us doing that regular, uh, in, in terms of general sense. Did I say him? Yeah, remember the, um, the general sense, the, um, I had just drawn a complete blank on the one I just talked about. Um, the um, pardon me. Analogy. The analogy of faith. The analogy of faith. Thank you so much. The analogy of faith is good. And then he uses another phrase: general tenor. T e n o r. What's the tenor of the text? Okay. Now uh, he also wants us to read. This is in some ways repetitive, but I think it's the way he underlines things. You want to be open. God when you read the text. You ever walk in to the house and you got Sunday school the next day and you're supposed to read a text and you got to do it and you just had a crappy thing happen and you sit down to read that text and you say, well, I'm going to read it, but. Hmm? See, that's when the training comes into play. All right. That's when the formation comes into play. Um, Wesley says that God will write the text on our heart. God will. Now, the heart is not mere subjectivity in Scripture and not in Wesley. It's really the center of emotion. It's the very center of who we are, what we are, our beliefs, our practices, in other words, the energy for that. So, God will write on our hearts. And then he calls us again to meditate on what we've read. Okay. And remember in reading the text, and this is so important. Remember the character of God 
as a loving God who is out to save the world and to take the entire cosmos to its consummation, hmm? to, its, to its wholeness, its completeness, its fullness. When the Bible says completeness, that's a better word than perfection. You will find perfection in the scripture in some translations, but the better word is completeness. And what God does is to take the entire cosmos to its completion. All right. Uh, so keep that in mind. And then second, a picture of the Christian life. All right. Um, <clears throat> Bishop James Tyndall is a friend of mine. He heads the Urban Summit. He's a bishop in the Metropolitan Spiritual Church. Uh, I interviewed him for a manuscript I'm working on. And uh, he, he, he made the, I'm, I'm studying the micro practices. What are the little bitty things that pastors do who are good at justice work, you know? And uh, I've, I went after 55, I got about 45 clergy. Oh, it is. I'm not bragging about the book. I'm bragging about the pastors. It is wonderful. The, the practices in which they engage, you know, and one from Bishop Tyndall. And I think we'll stop with this. He's in worship. A man comes in drunk and sits down on a back pew and starts raising Cain. People pull together around a bishop, say, Bishop, we got to get rid of him. He said, no, no, we're not going to do it. We're going to let him be here. We're going to let him fall asleep. And we're going to work with him. And you know what? That's exactly what they did. What happens if some guy comes in here on Sunday and he is really gone? And Evie says, leave him alone. What are we going to do? <laughs> Obey the pastor. <laughs> I would leave him alone. I'd go sit next to him. That'd be good. That'd be all right. That'd be good. That's even better. You know what they did? They wrapped themselves around that guy, changed his life, quit drinking, became a member of the church. Hmm. Uh, the identity of God and the picture of what a Christian life is. Okay, we're halfway there. Now, here's what I want you to do. Let me get my notes here. Uh, oh, come on, sweetie. The... Uh, I want us to do a little exercise. Oh, did all of you who were not here last week, did you get a copy of the piece over here with the scripture in it? It's from Romans 12. Uh, well, is, is, that, is that this week's? Oh, no, no, we need this week. Oh, good. All right, here's what I want you to do. Uh, just hang with me for just a minute. Uh, I want you can. Uh, are you in, are you in too big a group? If there's six of you, what if we had three? Uh, I'm going to leave that with you. Okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to read the biblical text that is from Romans 12. There, you see it there at the very toward the very end of your paper. Okay, and one of you can read it for the group. Now, here's what I want you to do in the exercise. Look, look above the reading and see where it says an exercise. You see that there? It'll be the next to the last page, I think. E no, it's the next to the next to the last page. All right. In other words, go above Romans 12 up to where it says an exercise. And then here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you first to pray and pray that God will speak to you through this text, okay? And then secondly, I'd like one of you, or you could spread it around, to read the biblical text, okay? And then uh, I'd like for you as a group to meditate on that text. Talk about it. Think about it. What does it mean? How does it speak to you? And then I'd like you to ask the question, how does this text affect my life or how would it affect my life, our lives? Okay, you got what we're going to do? And then close with prayer. So what I'm asking you to do in effect <clears throat> is 
remembering these things, and they're all there in that the first part of that uh, write-up. Remember all these things. Uh, you won't do that, but think about those things and go through this exercise together. Okay, and let's see if we can do the exercise in 15, no more than 20 minutes, and then we'll come back together. You got it? Any questions? That, that clear? In other words, we're going to try to do what we've been talking about. Okay? <laughs> Give it a shot. <clears throat> How about back here? What did you folks... Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, of course. How about back here? What... I think it did something to me. Help, Chung Ho. I'll talk loud. What did you folks, uh, what struck you? We agreed that it's very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> the reading was difficult? Yeah. Doing it is difficult. Doing it is difficult. Oh, yeah. What we're asked to do. It's just almost anything in there. Mm-hmm. It's difficult. Yeah, let me say too that that you could read that as kind of a summary of, of Paul's ethics, you know. But let me ask you this question: Was there one of those that struck you that you said, you know, I really ought to work on that one? Was there one of them that struck you there? You know, sometimes you don't have to. You know, who can do all that stuff at once, right? Uh, people that are mean to you. How do you respond to that? Yeah. We talked about the issue that we have with all of the migrants trying to come here because of the terrible circumstances they have mm -hmm. and how if we did what this says, we'd be welcoming to them. Uh. And we have a hard time doing that. Uh-huh. Could you hear that? Yeah. Um, yeah. We would like to welcome them, but how many can you welcome? How many uh. can you handle? Mm-hmm. The better question would be how many are you willing not to welcome? Yeah. How many what? How many are you willing not to welcome? How many are you going to leave over there starving and in poverty and in violence? Yeah. Well, probably that that immigration issue, it's you know, it's a broken system. We haven't had anybody that can solve it yet. Uh, the thing that I would the thing that I would want to say, I think, is how do we at least as the church begin to place that story in the Christian story and not in the political story? You know, how do we put that in the story of Christ rather than dividing up and putting it in the Democrat story, or the Republican story? Neither one of them have one, right? Uh, <laughs> I mean, they don't have an answer. But how do we put that in the Christian story? That'd be my, that'd be one way I, let me put it another, that's the way I struggle with it because I don't have answers to it either. I worked in uh, Phoenix for 12 years in organizing and we were trying to deal with immigrants. We had a different situation. We had a lot of growers that had to have the immigrants, so they wanted them to come in. We had other people that didn't. But how do we put that in Christ's story? How about here? We we talked about that everything that needed to, that we were being instructed to do and and see this as a uh, goal hmm. um, a goal to live more like Christ mm -hmm. um, uh, even though it's hard but you just keep starting over again mm -hmm. but we did get hung up on this coals on keeping coals on the, the head <laughs> <laughs> so can you talk about that a little bit uh, I can I have trouble with it too. <laughs> Remember, remember one thing. I wanted to see those coals coming down after I gave them the water. You know, I wanted to see God. <laughs> Let me put it this way: that uh, Paul will say things at times that I don't particularly like. Sometimes, when he says something, it may very well be something that someone added later. We have good reason to believe that. For example, some of the things about women that we talked about last week. Um, the third thing I would say is, though, notice one thing, that for Paul, judgment is a consequence of what we do. 
It's not an imposed consequence from God. Now, the, the only way I know to read that line is that, is that he believes that when you violate these kinds of things, the consequence is coals on your head. All I can say is that when I violate them, I sure experience that. But but it says their heads. Yeah. yeah, the people who the people who did the who did the violation, they will experience the coals on their head. Assuming they have a conscience, they're going to feel bad. Okay. Right. Yeah. So assuming they have a conscience, they're going to feel bad. May not have a conscience. Right. May not have a conscience. Then what? I thought about leaving that off. <laughs> What would what would Wesley say to that? Look at it from several different angles. Don't just read it literally. Don't read it literally. What about reading it in the light of the other things in that very text? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And did that mean something different back then than the way we think it means now? No. You don't think so? Uh, <laughs> I don't know how to squirm out of that. <laughs> what about? How about you? You got an idea? Well, looking there? at number three up there. Uh huh. Respond. Read in response to the character of, of God. God. Yeah. So if I'm reading that, because vengeance is a big word, wrath is a big word, and we have preconceived notions. But if I'm reading that in light of the the character of God being loving and restorative, mm -hmm. I may not really understand what God's vengeance looks like. Like it might not be what I want vengeance to look mm -hmm. like for that person. It might That's be good. like really harsh mercy or something. You know what I mean? <laughs> like a painful mercy. Painful mercy. I don't get to decide because it's God's. But if it's in the loving nature of God, like I have. I know, sorry, that's just the one that. I think that's me. good, but that's using Wesley. Uh -huh. All right, and that's a, that's a way to respond to it. You can still look at that heaping of coals as a kind of metaphor or something of a loving God, but it's not. God, it's their conscience. It's the, they they know what they've done, and when somebody's really still nice to them in spite of that, it just makes them feel that much more guilty. Mm -hmm. So it may not be that God's actually dumping, <laughs> burning coals on their head. You know? I haven't seen that lately. I haven't seen that lately either. Yeah. All right. What about you, folks? What what struck you? I think we really, at first, we really focused on the idea of being conformed, do not be conformed, but be transformed, and how that transformation, Evie had a good point about the transformation of the renewing of your minds, like we're constantly growing and changing our minds, and mm -hmm. it's a more childlike way of living, rather than being, as Bill said, but we already know everything, mm -hmm. you know, rather <laughs> than being so set in our ways. Uh -huh. And so we really focused on that as a way of um, trying to live into this. I was in a meeting today with 10 philosophers, well, nine and me. And, uh, and one, of the, one of the quotes that came out, we meet once a month, one of the quotes that came out, we never get it right. You know, we never get it right. But we worship a God who gets us right with God. Mm -hmm. How about you folks? What you got? You go ahead. Me? You took a big old breath. I heard it. <laughs> well, in my very simplistic place in, in, in my head right now, there was a lot of words that basically said, be nice, and then I got stuck on the coals on my head. <laughs> it's true. It's true. We spent a lot of time with coals. I'm being honest. Yeah. Uh -huh. Be nice, and then the coal on the head thing really bothered me. So. Yeah. Let me ask a question this way, too. And, you know, there are all kinds of ways to read this, so I'm not suggesting this is the way. Um, have you not ever done something in your life and experienced a judgment that in some ways would be like that? Oh, golly, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But not literal coals on that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know that they're literal coals. No, no. Yeah. yeah. But, it, yeah. You, the thing is... This table was talking about um, the character of God, all the words, and then, and then you said that that might have been added later. That makes perfect sense to me because it's just, it doesn't fit in the passage at all. Hmm. It, it doesn't seem to, does it? No. But, but 
There it is. But but there it is. Yeah, I I don't know what to tell you about that. I, I think we've had some good responses though. That 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 works. How about you folks? Yeah, <laughs> uh, I found that there. This was once almost a blessing. It was also kind of confusing. Really confused me was uh, vengeance. You know, we're reading it in the light of the loving God, and we're reading vengeance is mine, says the Lord. And so those to me kind of knocked me off stride a little bit when I was reading through that. Uh, hmm. I didn't want to think of God as having a vengeful side or aspect. Mm -hmm. So that was one thing that cut me. The other thing that made me think this is we make plans. I'm going to go to college, I'm going to get a degree, I'm going to get a job, I'm an engineer and build the biggest boat that's ever been built. God willing. But this is kind of a, a different kind of plan. It tells you what kind of person to be as you go along that other path. Mm -hmm. You're always seeking God's will along the way, but it's it's more of a life plan than anything. Mm -hmm. I thought of a coals on my head. Okay, <laughs> I was uh, I was I was lecturing in class one day, and it used to be that I did not like the song In the Garden, okay? So I decided that I would critique In the Garden. I go to the garden alone. And I said, hear the individualism, folks? When, <laughs> when the dew is still on the roses and he walks with me and talks to me, this is me and Jesus. Where's the church? Where's the community? You know, and I went on and I mean, I just kind of, I kind of plowed the ground of that song and then salted it, you know? <laughs> And I said, nothing will grow on that song again. I was really quite proud of myself. <laughs> the class gets up, the bell rings shortly thereafter, and they begin to leave the room. And I notice one woman is waiting to be last. And finally, she's the only one. And she walks up to me and said, uh, Tex, my father used to screw me twice a week. And after every one of those ordeals, I would go outside and I would sing that song to me. And she said, without that song, I could not have made it. And then she said to me, don't you ever, ever Make fun of that song in my presence again. Can you feel the sizzle? Can you feel the sizzle? So I, I think there may yet be a, a place for it. How about over here? When we focus in on number 12, we identify God as a God of love. Mm -hmm. uh, and the marks of a true Christian, those are... Uh, snapshots, uh, characteristics uh, that we need to follow in response to God's love. Um, and uh, it's those are certainly challenges, but uh, that's how the scripture shapes us live a Christian life mm -hmm. and uh, that's how we need to respond to God's message to us mm -hmm. and through that it mm -hmm. gives us grace mm -hmm. um, I think something one of the tables brought up the problem of immigration and you know that's a kind of a political issue it's best not to think of it as a problem as a whole, but to think of it, what would any one of us do if someone came to our door? We never, we don't know what we could obviously tell that they were hungry or they're getting sunburned for lack of clothes or you know something. Would we turn them away or would we 
trying to respond like a Christian should and mm-hmm. give, offer them food, offer them some clothing, offer them a way to mm-hmm. get housing. So it can be a personal challenge. Yeah, might also be a group challenge. How can the church that. respond as well yeah, as how right, a person yeah, could, right? Mm-hmm. Level of church yeah. And, uh, this is a challenge to us as individuals, mm-hmm. Christian individuals. Mm-hmm. All right. Other comments? Anything occurred to you as we've been working through this? We're almost done. We'll quit it on time. Let me ask you this question. Might you think about one beginning to read the Bible? (laughs) Some don't, I suspect. Uh, Secondly, would you think about prayer before you read it? Third, would you read the text and then think about it, meditate on it? And then ask the question, what does this mean to me? And what does it mean to Platwood's church? You know, remember, folks, we are the church. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, we've got our own story. Uh, don't misunderstand me. I love at least the best of the American dreams, and I love my country. Uh, but I'm very clear, when I die, the American eagle is not going to sweep down and take me into eternal life. Mm-hmm. And so our primary story is the story of the church. Uh, um, I I better not let that story occur to me (laughs) another time. Next time, what we will do is we're going to look at something of the backdrop of Wesley's theology so that we will understand how he's reading the text as we've been looking at it these two times. You understand? So we're going to look at a kind of a big picture Wesley as a way in which we can understand these two lessons we've had so far in the use of the text. We will deal with the text, of course, but uh, is that is that clear? And uh, I think we'll have a good time. I like y'all. <laughs> Although you come up with stinking questions I can't answer. <laughs> That's not allowed in this class. All right. Well, hey, go in peace. And may that God who appears in the text and calls us to life. May that God go with us all. Amen. 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 Thank you.